An unnatural sex act committed between persons of male sex or by humans with animals is punishable by imprisonment. The loss of civil rights might also be imposed. Shortly after Germany unified as a nation, this law was added to the Reich Penal Code in 1871. Notably, this section of the Penal Code makes no mention of sex acts among women. It's not for lack of trying. In the early 1900s, there was a debate about whether or not homosexual acts among women should also be criminalized. But as policymakers could not define female sexuality, it was never put into law. The cultural tug of war between accepting homosexuality and criminalizing it continued for decades. All the while, history was being made. The Great War devastated much of Europe, but perhaps no country felt it as deeply as Germany. With the removal of its Kaiser, shortly before the end of the war, the future of the young republic was in the hands of its people. Due to the reparations and concessions of the Treaty of Versailles, the country suffered an economically, politically, and culturally turbulent period. Despite the instability, Berlin became a mecca of gay culture under the newly established Weimar Republic due to the relative tolerance of the police at the time. Although paragraph 175 was still in effect and members of the community continued to be harassed and convicted for their deviant behavior, the punishments were rarely severe. According to Robert Beachy, a historian that specializes in this area, the tolerance is explained as the decision of one commissioner who recognized the impossibility of enforcing this law. It is a crime with very few witnesses after all. So, the commissioner and by extension, the police, accepted the deviants while continuing to monitor the situation. This allowed for open discussions of sexuality and gender norms. The Institute of Sex Research, which did everything from marriage therapy to identity support, was founded by the renowned Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld in 1919. With his support, people who might today be considered gender nonconforming or transgender could be permitted to dress in accordance with their identities using transvestite passes. Meanwhile, gay, lesbian, and transvestite bars and clubs had become pillars of the community. The drag ball scene thrived. There were even openly published and distributed lesbian and gay journals sold across Germany. This all came to an abrupt end when the Nazis rose to power in 1933. After several electoral victories by the Nazi party, Hitler was appointed chancellor by the president, Paul von Hindenburg. Shortly after his appointment, the crusade against homosexuals and transvestites was evident. Gay, lesbian, and transvestite bars, clubs, organizations, and publications were shut down. Soon after, Nazi students and soldiers broke into the Institute of Sex Research, robbed the libraries of its books, and burned them. Decades of research, up in smoke. What made this crusade such a priority? The Nazis fundamentally saw homosexuality as immoral. One aspect of this immorality was the belief that relationships and intercourse were meant to produce Aryan children. Therefore, homosexuals were robbing the country of this invaluable resource. Moreover, homosexuality was considered either contagious or a learned behavior. Either way, removing them from society would eliminate the corruption. It was also thought that this was a social ill brought about by the Jewish people, as many of the influential figures of the movement were Jewish. Propelled by these motivations, the hate crusade against homosexuality began. Despite the rapid start, the Nazi party prioritized the arrests of homosexuals who were either Jewish or leftists. Otherwise, Paragraph 175 was not heavily enforced. This is likely due to Ernst Röhm, the leader of the SA, or the Stormtroopers. Before the Nazi party ascended to power, Röhm had been tried as a homosexual. As a known homosexual, he did little to enforce paragraph 175. And homosexuals and sympathizers joined the Stormtroopers, perhaps believing they'd be protected as Röhm was perceived to be. Unfortunately, their trust had been misplaced. In 1934, the political climate in Germany intensified. Hitler saw the declining health of the president and knew he would need to bring the people together under his rule. But there was an issue, one 
rather large issue. The military hated him and his rowdy, uncontrollable stormtroopers. Hitler decided to trade the SA for political power through the Night of the Long Knives. From June 30th through July 2nd of 1934, SA leaders, including Rome, as well as other political opponents, were arrested. Within days, an estimated 500 people were all executed without trial for a plot against the Nazi party. There was no plot. With Rome out of the way, there was no place to hide. In 1935, the Nazi party overhauled the criminal code, including paragraph 175. A male who commits a sex offense with another male or allows himself to be used by another male for a sex offense shall be punished with imprisonment. Where a party was not yet 21 years of age at the time of the act, the court may, in especially minor cases, refrain from punishment. Paragraph 175a. Penal servitude up to 10 years or, where there are mitigating circumstances, imprisonment of not less than three months shall apply to, one, a male who, with violence or the threat of violence to body and soul or life, compels another male to commit a sex offense with him or to allow himself to be abused for a sex offense. Two, a male who, by abusing a relationship of dependence based upon servitude, employment, or subordination, induces another male to commit a sex offense with him or to allow himself to be abused for a sex offense. Three, a male over 21 years of age who seduces a male person under 21 years to commit a sex offense with him or to allow himself to be abused for a sex offense. 4. A male who publicly commits a sex offense with males or allows himself to be abused by males for a sex offense or offers himself for the same. Under the new law, there was plenty of room for interpretation. You could be charged for something so minor as a glance at someone. And this new law was enacted in September of 1935. This aggressive law's enforcement was supervised by Heinrich Himmler, the man known as the architect of the Holocaust, after he became the chief of German police in 1936. Through raids and denouncements, the police hunted for homosexual men. Police raided establishments associated with the homosexual community. Those captured were interrogated. Denouncements relied on intel provided by informants. After being reported, a man would be interrogated. If he were deemed guilty by the police, he would be arrested and either tried or sent directly to a concentration camp. The consequences of violating paragraph 175 were inconsistent. Before the war, 78,000 people were arrested or institutionalized for violating paragraph 175. After World War II began, the law's enforcement became even less consistent. Arrests declined because the war became the top priority. Even homosexual men were sometimes permitted to join the military rather than be arrested. Himmler, the dedicated homophobe, dictated a harsher approach in July of 1940. Any convicted homosexual who had seduced more than one partner would be sent to a concentration camp after serving their prison time to contain the homosexual contagion from German society. The SS decided in 1942 to send habitual criminals to concentration camps to work them into the grave. An estimated 15,000 prisoners were sent to die in the camps. It is unknown what percentage of those were homosexual. As was the case for all prisoners, patches were sewn onto the uniforms of each of the prisoners. The uniforms of those convicted with violating paragraph 175 were adorned with a pink triangle, but it may as well have been a target. The men wearing the pink triangles faced abuse from fellow prisoners and guards alike. Few survived more than a few months in the camps. The war came to a close, and prisoners were liberated from the concentration camps. Convicted homosexuals, however, were forced to continue serving their sentence, whether they'd served part of their time in a concentration camp or not. They were also denied the compensation other victims had received. They were not recognized as victims of the Holocaust until 1985 by the German government. 
When the Nazi era laws were overturned shortly after the end of the war, the revised paragraph 175 remained in effect. It wasn't overturned until 1994. Violators of paragraph 175 were pardoned in 2002, and the convictions were finally annulled and restitution began to be paid in 2017. Now, fully absolved of their alleged crimes, the very symbol that marked members of our community as criminals has been reclaimed as a symbol of pride. Thank you for watching. If you would like to know more, there are the resources that I used to create this video available in the description below. And if you would like to hear a more detailed approach to the history of the pink triangles, I recommend James Summerton's The Story of the Gay Holocaust, a complete documentary.